it's interesting because I I like the idea of neurons that um, fire together, wire together. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. But I think the idea of really changing habits is something that as university students we're, we're quite interested in. I'm quite interested in this idea of drinking culture, for example, where you go drinking every night and then you say to yourself, oh, I should be drinking less alcohol, for example. And I, um, I was wondering if you could give advice to university students to change, <laughs> to change, to change their habits. How do, how do you yeah. get that energy? Because you're surrounded uh. by people with this constant peer pressure. And yeah, how do you, how do you change that? Yeah, I, as I said earlier, um, because the hardest part about breaking a habit or changing is not making the same choice that you did the day before. And the moment you decide to make a different choice, get ready because you're going to feel uncomfortable. You're actually leaving the known familiar self. And when you step out and you're no longer doing the same thing or making the same choice or having the same experience or feeling the same emotions or hanging with the same people, your body is craving <laughs> what it's used to. So the body yeah. starts telling the brain because it wants you to return back to the same same state says, come on, Lucas, you can start tomorrow. Look, so-and-so's going, it's going to be fun. Everybody's going to be there. You, you know, it's, it's pub night, you know, my God, I'm going to, okay. And that your body telling your brain, Hey, we want to have the same experience to feel the same emotion. Mm -hmm. The body actually is telling the brain to think the same way, to make the same choice, to do the same thing, to create the same experience, to feel the same feeling, and the person stays the same. So then in order for a person to break that state, they have to be willing to be uncomfortable, and the body starts craving. And the, when the body starts craving, if the body is stronger than the mind then the person will make the same choice and return back to the same, um, the same habit. So a habit is a redundant set of automatic, unconscious thoughts, behaviors, and emotions that's acquired through repetition. A habit is when you've done something so many times that your body actually knows how to do it better than your conscious mind. It becomes automatic and it's subconscious. So a lot of choices that people make on a regular basis or subconscious or unconscious choices, they think they're making the choice consciously, but actually it's the body that's making the choice instead of the mind. I, so then- I, Sorry to just jump in here, but that really reminds me of of cigarettes and smoking and this this thing with, I was quite addicted to nicotine for, for a while and I only stopped once I feel I genuinely told myself with, with the most firm intention and I really like the way you- you phrase that in your in your writing this this firm intention where you have to convince yourself that you're going to quit and i feel that smoking for example is something that almost happens unconsciously where you light another cigarette and then light another one and i think that stopping cigarettes i feel like your teachings could be could be helpful for for someone who's struggling to to quit such a habit sure sure and and i and 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 you can make that choice to change in one moment, and it takes a firm intention. And that's when you make up your mind, when you say, that this is it. I don't care who's going to be at the pub environment. I don't care how I feel, body. I don't care how long it takes. I'm going to stop. And when you make that decision with such firm intention that the amplitude of that choice carries a level of energy that causes your body to respond to your mind. That choice that you're making in that moment is an experience that you'll never forget. And many people will say, I remember exactly where I was, the time of day it was, who I was with when I made up my mind to change. And the stronger the emotion you feel to make that change, the more you remember the choice. And it takes that thought and that feeling that image and that emotion and that stimulus and response that's actually conditioning the body into a new biology. It's actually causing the body to respond to the mind. And the event becomes a moment in time that you never forget. And that's exactly how we create a long-term memory. The stronger the emotion you have from some experience, the more you remember the event. But now this is an inward experience and you gotta come out of your resting state. And when you come out of your resting state, 
That's the moment the body's getting new information and the body is precognitive. In other words, it's always spying on the brain. And if you're sitting on your couch saying, oh yeah, I'm going to stop this habit or I'm going to stop this and you don't come out of your resting state, the body knows you're lying. The body knows you're going to do the exact same thing you always do. But many people wait for crisis, for trauma, for disease, for diagnosis, for loss. In some way, they're waiting for something to, to get really bad where they finally make up their mind to change. Why wait? You know, why wait? If you know better... An addiction is when you you know something is not good for you and you do it anyway. That's an addiction. An addiction is something where you think you can't stop it on some level. And yet the current human, the, the, the human drama is wait for the crisis, wait for it to get so bad that you can't go back to business as usual and make the change. And, and you don't have to do that. Yeah. I think you're so right about the kind of positive emotion as well being added on to that firm intention. And in the case of addiction, we're talking about this is all negative. One of the examples I love from negative in the sense of getting rid of something. What I love, one of the examples in your book, and this is where your thoughts are really grounded in science is the example of piano playing and of mental rehearsal. And what you're saying about the body being precognitive, what you just said is the perfect example of that spying on the brain. And, you know, even thinking about um, some sort of, piece that you're going to be playing. I don't know. I'm not a piano player, but back or whatever, whatever people play is, we do is, is we do most as effective. We, we do it all the time. It's called mental rehearsal. Now just think about anybody who does anything really well. I don't care if you have a, a, a friend in your life that plays a guitar that just really knows how to play or uh, an actor or an actress of an athlete, um, a dancer. Uh, it doesn't matter. Anybody who gets really good at something spends a lot of time rehearsing their moves. They just do. So the research that's been done on that, and, and this is kind of interesting. You take a group of people that never played the piano before and you divide them into two different categories. And in the first group of people, you do a brain scan on them before they start the, the activity and you teach them one-handed scales and chords. And they come and they practice two hours a day for five days. And then they scan their brain at the end of five days and lo and behold, the act of playing the piano actually grows new circuits on the opposite side of their brain. Well, there's no magic there. Learn something new. Learning is making new connections. Get your body involved. Get your body involved. You're going to have an experience. Experience enriches the brain. Pay attention to what you're doing. You've got to pay attention and repeat it over and over again, firing and wiring, and you're going to assemble new neural architecture. There's no magic there. Take another group of people, do a brain scan on them, and then have them close their eyes and for two hours a day for five days, mentally rehearse those scales and chords in their mind, playing them over and over again. At the end of five days, they have the same structural changes in their brain as the people who are physically playing the piano. Now that means when you're truly present, the brain does not know the difference between the real life experience of playing the piano and what you're imagining. Now the brain is typically a record of the past. Everything you've learned and experienced is wired in your brain. But now you are priming the brain to be a map to the future. How do we know that? Because the brain looks like they already had the experience. The brain looks like they've been playing the piano for the last five days and they never lifted a finger. Now why is that important? Well, it's, it's important because if you take those people and you put them in front of a piano, and they'll sit down, they've never played before, they can play those scales and chords as if they were playing for the last five days. They've primed their brain for the act. Now, if you keep doing it over and over again, the hardware that they're installing becomes more like a software program and it becomes more automatic. So now, forget the piano player. Let's just talk about the person who has a difficulty in their life with a, an ex-relationship or with a coworker or with a parent, and they keep reacting and responding and behaving in the same way, okay? If I wanted to change uh, whatever it was, it would make sense then if I close my eyes and say, what am I going to do in this situation? How am I going to be different if I, if I go into this, this circumstance? And they start rehearsing the act. They start installing the circuitry. Why is that beneficial? because they actually have hardware in place to use. <laughs> and then all they have to do is get their behaviors now to match their intentions. If they don't rehearse, they have no hardware in place and they'll default back to the old person. Okay, so mental rehearsal changes the brain. What about the body? Take a group of men, 
uh, the research was done at Cleveland Clinic, have them come for an hour a day for two weeks, test their muscles, a bicep strength, before they learn this activity, close their eyes, and for an hour a day for two weeks, they mentally rehearse curling uh, a dumbbell. And they add the emotional component of harder, stronger, more intense. Two weeks later, there's a 13.5 increase in muscle strength. They never lifted a weight. Now, the body is responding to the mind by thought alone. Now, why is that important? Well, because the body has to get a new signal and new information. And it's so objective in the process that when you emotionally add the component, the body actually is believing it's having the experience. That's it's incredible, right? So the person who has a chronic health condition that's doing their meditations to, to, to make changes and to, and, and to change so they can heal. If they're doing their meditation an hour a day and they have less pain and they have less fatigue and they're sleeping better, but their blood values are still the same, their, their scans are not changing, they go to the next level. I got to get so good at doing this with my eyes closed in my meditation, I got to do it with my eyes open. I'm going to wait one hour of a good meditation against 15 hours of reacting and responding as the same person. Oh my God, let me rehearse how I'm going to be in certain circumstances in my mind so that I don't default and I can stay in the state with my eyes open. And that's when it gets to be really exciting. That's when the person is actually overcoming the old self and becoming a new self, believing in a possibility, behaving that way, and ultimately becoming it. 